I'm David Costanza. I'm a technology fellow here at Rice University in the architecture department. When I came to Rice, we had one 3D printer and in the first seminar that I taught, we wrote a grant and we were able to buy a series of desktop printers. We then used the work that was produced in that course to write a larger grant and that allowed us to purchase the Gigabot to allow the work that we were doing, the research at the smaller scale to scale up with the larger 3D printer. The primary way that the Gigabot gets used is to produce representational models. So kind of scale models of buildings or portions of buildings. We looked at various different kinds of printers. We considered SLS per SLA. The limit of those processes is that they don't really allow for the scaling up of something that might be architectural. Because we're very interested in the full scale here in the architecture department, we can really treat the fusion deposition model as something that could scale up. Right, the thing that we're printing on the Ultimaker can scale up to the Gigabot, and the thing on the Gigabot can scale up to a KUKA arm with a fusion deposition extruder at the end of a gantry crane. So we can print things to scale of buildings using the same technique. By using a FDM printer, we could essentially replicate more or less at a different scale, something that could happen at an architectural scale. When the Gigabot is used to produce architectural representational scale models, it's typically to produce geometry that would be otherwise quite difficult to replicate physically, that is quite simple to produce digitally. The Gigabot allows us to produce fairly large-scale representational models. I've used it in the same way for a number of my own research projects. I was designing a chair with another faculty member, Andrew Colopy. In the end, the chair was produced using a thermoforming process and a different material, but we were still able to iterate the design of the chair using the 3D printer. As we were manipulating the geometry of the chair and the kind of curvature of the chair, the Gigabot allowed us to produce quick iterative prototypes of how the chair might look, that we could evaluate it for its aesthetic qualities, but also even some of its performative qualities. And so we built a number of small-scale mock-ups all the way up to a half-scale version of the chair on the Gigabot. And between each iteration, we were able to manipulate the double curvature of the chair, which is what produced the stiffness for the back, or the double curvature of the seat, which allowed for various degrees of comfort. Another project that I've used the Gigabot for is the kind of communal play structure, something that would bring disparate communities together to play, where one interaction by a certain individual would have certain repercussions for someone else on the play structure. So it's sort of a collective bench or possibly like a seesaw made up of a series of hammocks. The object itself is about 15 feet in diameter and is asymmetrical. So to one side, you have larger surfaces which allow you to lay down. And on the other side, you have a kind of narrower surface which forces you to maybe sit upright. But depending on the number of people that are occupying the structure, it will kind of tip to one side or to the other. So the name of the object is Tip Tap. It's really meant to bring people together through coordinated play. The entire structure was a sort of skeleton of these off-the-shelf fiberglass protrusions connected with these highly intricate kind of complex nodes. There are 32 nodes. Each node is unique. They were all printed on the Gigabot and then wrapped with fiberglass. So the fiberglass is operating structurally and the PLA print from the Gigabot really serves as the mold for that fiberglass structure. I designed the nodes for the tip-tap play structure around the scale of the Gigabot, knowing that they would be 3D printed, knowing how long it would take to print those objects and the kind of scale that I could produce and the quality of those parts. So if we didn't have the Gigabot, I either would have designed a different object or would have used a different process for constructing that object. Of course, we could machine mold out of foam and then fiberglass the foam. All of those would have been more time consuming and labor intensive. So in the end, we probably would have designed a different object if we did not have the Gigabot.